stay tuned for the Joan Quinn Profiles. Joan served the state of California as a member on the Arts Council and on the Film Commission. She was formerly on the Architectural Commission and fulfilled two terms on the Fine Arts Commission for the city of Beverly Hills. As an editor for Andy Warhol's Interview Magazine, Condé Nast Publications, and the Hearst Corporation, Joan covered the world of fashion, the mysteries of food, the excitement of theater, and the international art scene. She continues to find people who are on the cutting edge of their professions. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. We're taping here in the Hollywood Museum, and we're not in our regular spot up on the fourth floor. We're here in the makeup room uh, for brownettes, whatever that means. We're all brownettes today. Um, and it's in the historic Max Factor building, so you know they did all the makeup and everything else that a brownette had to do in this makeup room. And you can see some of the people on the walls. Our guests are actress twins, Elizabeth and Emily Hinkler, and author Don McKean. Twins, Emily and Elizabeth Hinkler, were born and raised in Chicago graduated from the University of Iowa where they were in the acting program. That proved to open doors for you, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> because yes. what happened, everyone talks about identical twins, and you were in the writing program. Were you the inspiration for anyone? Uh, we were the inspiration for our playwright Janet Schlop Cole, and she wrote a two-woman play for both of us, which we were blown away by the opportunity. And how, how did that come about, uh, Elizabeth? Well, actually, we're not really sure. We know she was writing a lot of plays, and we didn't know her. We only had heard of her, like this, this ominous, you know, uh, star. And she was very well known, the well known yes. writer in mm -hmm. the program. And, and, the mm -hmm. and then our junior year, she sent us a script. Oh, is that right? It was your junior year? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you actually worked on it while you were in college. We mm -hmm. did. Mm -hmm. And did she do a lot of rewrites? Yes. Yes, she yes. did a lot of rewrites. She likes to make every word perfect. Um, and she also looked at our relationship and how we interact as twins and wrote more of that into the play. Well, tell us about that. What is identical? What is an identical twin? <laughs> I, Elizabeth, you okay. answer. <laughs> yeah, uh, so identical twins... Um, how they're born is from one egg, and then the egg splits. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, we're mirror image twins, which is only in 4% of identical twins. So you're mirror twins. What does that mean? Um, it just means that like everything externally is flipped. Mm -hmm. So if you look at each other, you're like looking in a mirror. Her yeah. right hand and your left hand go up. Right, mm -hmm. and I'm left-handed and she's right-handed. Oh, you are as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So did she write that into the play? No, actually, my character um, is right-handed because uh, my my character Matilda has cerebral palsy and her left side is affected. So, yeah, I, I decided to be right-handed to make it um, easier. So, tell me um, what the play is about. Okay, go. Uh, the play is of two sisters. I play Magda. Uh, aspiring cabaret performer and a hospital floor mopper by day. So you're the singer? I sing, mm -hmm. yes, and I do some cabaret acts. And, and uh, I'm Matilda, who is her writer, um, and she stays at home, and she's homebound because she has cerebral palsy. Um, so, so is it a, it's a musical. It's, it it's, didn't start out to be a musical. Very right, true. Right. It, first, I only sang like one song. I wouldn't necessarily call it a musical, but I would call it a play with music like. in it. Um, I do now, I do a couple of numbers, which our director added in. Um, but it's the story of two sisters wanting to pursue their dreams while the world right now is, uh, it's, it's pre-war Berlin. They're um, in Berlin. Like, mm -hmm. They're in Germany, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's about how the sisters have to work together um, to try to achieve their dreams. So are you a writer? I do like writing. Um, I mean, mostly I am an actor, but... But do you sing? I, yes, I do sing, too. And do you write? 
I do write as well, but primarily act. So could you have shifted parts in this play? Could you, oh, boy. Could you have been the palsy girl? Um, yes. I mean, I feel like it's, it's a, a physical uh, challenge that I would have liked to uh, try, but we picked the roles because um, we, Elizabeth actually tore her ACL um, when we were younger, and so I took care of her and I'd carry her around oh, you did? a lot. Yeah. So um, we picked the roles for that reason. How did that happen? Uh, we were ballerinas. Um, besides doing acting, mm -hmm. and then uh, we had we we were super intensive about it, and mm -hmm. then one day I just tore my ACL, and that was kind of when we decided that we would pause on being ballerinas because we're really short and we're not really the type anyway. Mm -hmm. So we were like, well, we'll fully pursue acting. Mm -hmm. So did you when you were growing up? Did you always want to be actors? We didn't really know what it was. We didn't know what it was, but we wanted to always play pretend. Yeah. So, <laughs> so it kind of was put hand on hand. shows for your family. We did. Yes, yes, constantly. <laughs> so it was like the beginning. But was there any acting in your family? No. no our, both of our all. parents are dancers, and they're. Oh, uh, they are dancers. Right? Yes. And what kind of dancers? Uh, ballroom and jazz and belly dancing. Yeah. Did they do it professionally? Our um, dad, our dad, dad did. did for your a dad bit. did, and mm -hmm. where? In Chicago. In Chicago. Yeah. So they were motivated to have you take ballet classes and different kinds of things that would be theatrical. Really, yeah. Right. Yeah, they encouraged it. So here you are. You're both in the same play. It's called My Sister. It's at the Odyssey. You told us the story, Emily. Uh, Elizabeth, you told us a little bit about your part, but how it's the palsied sister. How did you actually train to do that? Because I watched you every minute. You never came out. You never came out of your character. Um, well, I think because we have dance backgrounds, um, it's usually easy for us to connect with very physical roles. A, um, a lot of the roles that we do have are, um, they're just very, more extreme characters, and I think that's why Janet decided to give us something that wasn't as spectacleized. Mm -hmm. So in preparing for the role, um, four months before our original production, I delved into researching um, what exactly the type of cerebral palsy I had. Um, and we originally thought we were going to have German accents. Oh, yeah. So you I didn't, was, did you? Yeah, we didn't. Mm -hmm. So I, because I just felt like it would be too much for just like too much of a shock to try to understand us like on another way in my speech mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because her speech is already affected affected because of her cerebral mm -hmm. palsy so you do talk like that and how do you lift her you lift her sometimes mm -hmm. uh, i don't know <laughs> I, I mean i had i had a, a lot of practice doing it um but we can pick each other up yeah, I don't know. It's just something I guess we can do. And then, <laughs> and then you tell us about your role and how you trained for it because you do a lot of singing, actually, and changing on stage. Yeah. Oh yeah, um, I, <laughs> Magda never really stops doing stuff. So I, I mean, I all whenever we get the blocking and the props, I just always have to make sure that I that my stage business is a secondary thing. It's yeah. more of like a routine that I do. Um, I am not a trained singer at all. So when our new, when our director, our co-director Ron Saucy um, said, "Oh, I want you know to have all these songs," I was like, "Okay," because um, I'd only done one song before. And so I, I mean, before that, ever since our original production, I researched cabaret back then oh, and right. really tried to immerse myself in that. It was totally different, wasn't it? Very Cabaret much so. There. Oh, yeah. 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 It was very uh, stylized. Mm -hmm. So you had to learn that style. Mm -hmm. But um, you have an accompaniment on stage. Mm -hmm. Somebody plays your music. Mm -hmm. That, for me, it, like, it was an idea that was shot out, and um, we just started working with it, and it just, it gives a whole different feel, and I, I love it. it 
especially because I can also interact with with Barbara, who's playing the piano, and you know we can look at each other. And who it's wrote really the songs? Nice. Um, Janet was a lyricist to oh, it. Oh, she was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But but what happened was when you first started this. Let's go back to school, and you were in the play. It went to this Riverside Theater, mm -hmm. and it was how long was it then? Was it a uh, short? I'd say it was 65 minutes. So it was short. It was like, and then you brought it to the fringe mm -hmm. for somehow. How did that happen? How did it get to the fringe? Which is Hollywood fringe, which is the best. Yeah. I love it. Um, well, the day we moved out here, we actually moved out here like a year ago, almost mm -hmm. to the day. Oh, you mm -hmm. moved out before you were going to be in the play? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, you were? And oh, I see. I thought the play brought you here. Oh, no. We, the day we got here, we decided to produce it instead of finding a place. Is that <laughs> so, right? Yeah. And you started the search? Oh, you started the search? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you found the fringe? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, good and, for you. And yeah. we were so, like, our, our playwright Janet, she said, you need to meet this director named Paul David Story. Oh, right. And at first we were hesitant to having a director because we'd already done the play a lot of times before. We were like, uh -huh. I don't know if we, uh -huh. you know, want to bring someone else in. But he was incredible. He really brought the world of the play to life mm -hmm. and made us... Uh, really go for it. But he did the fringe. He, he directed this fringe, which is not 65 minutes. That has to be really short, doesn't it? It mm -hmm. Sometimes it does have to be short, but we specifically asked our theater if it could be mm -hmm. 65 oh, the, minutes. Oh, so you had the whole thing fringe. at the fringe. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then when you came to the Odyssey, it was such a big hit at the Fringe, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and Paul came to the Odyssey with us, so he co-directed that, which is Awesome. And, and Ron Saucy is and there. Ron. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so then did they expand it at that point? Yes. Well, when we, one of the awards that we won for doing um, our show at Hollywood Fringe was an encore performance. So Ron had already come seen our show, and then the second time we had our encore, he brought the rest of the Odyssey members. Mm -hmm. oh, and see. right after that performance, he was like, well, I look forward to working with you. From then on, we right. didn't know what was going on, <laughs> so he, that's when he and Janet started collaborating, and he's like, mm -hmm. well, this is what I want. I want to show the other world, like Magda's world. So, so Janet was still in where? Chicago, Iowa? Where Iowa. was she? She was Iowa. in Iowa. <laughs> and she, did they know each other? No. No. So Ron just reached out and said, this is what we need, and mm -hmm. they started working. Well, that was great for Janet, wasn't it? Yeah. And great for you, because you knew her, and mm -hmm. she knew how to write for you. Well, it's fantastic. I, I, I thought it was mesmerizing. You both were you. so fantastic, and I think it's something that, will it go to film? <laughs> we, we really want it to. That's yes. our, our next step, um, to really to try to do that. And what was one of the favorite moments in the play for you? So we're almost finished. Um, oh. Uh, what did you like, Emily? I, I love all of the moments, but I think what really kick-starts uh, the show for me is when I when I come back to the apartment and I and I tell her that I got on to I got on stage and that's just a great a wonderful moment that I get I get really excited to tell her about. Yeah. Is she happy about it? Yeah. Me? Yes. 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 Is she happy about yes. it? Because yes. you've written it, right? Yeah. yeah. And and what was one of your favorite moments? Oh, I mean, besides that one, I also love that one. Um, I love when it, it's such a a simple moment, but I love when um, Emily has to change my pad on stage. Oh, I know. <laughs> I, and why I love it is because I feel like it really shares the, not only the bond of twins and the, the roles that we've become. It's like a caregiver, right? Yeah. It's like an, a really giving. It's very touching. Yeah. And it's hard to take. Mm -hmm. It is hard for the audience. And, and it's interesting that you feel that way about it. Yeah. Well, two identical twins now. I have to tell you, I have identical twins. Oh, you do? I do. Wow. And they're mirror twins. Oh, wow. <laughs> so That's you guys amazing. all fit into the same percentage. Yeah. Yeah, Jennifer and Amanda Quinn. Oh. 
and they look exactly alike. That's why when you walked in, I went, I'm not even going to try to bother which one is which <laughs> right. because no mm -hmm. one can figure it out. Right. So thank you for coming. Thank you, thank you so for much. Thank you. And thanks for watching this part of the show. We'll be right back with Don Anahid McKean. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back. We're at the Hollywood Museum, and we're in this makeup room for brownettes, whatever that means. This was the historic Max Factor building. And I'm with author, award-winning journalist, Don Anahid McKean, who was born and raised in Los Angeles and now lives in Orange County. But she's lived in San Francisco and New York, um, while she was writing for Salon Magazine and Smart Money and Newsdays. She holds a master's degree from Northwestern University in journalism and a bachelor's from the University of California, Berkeley. Her book, 100 Year Walk, An Armenian Odyssey, is a treasure. But let's start with your writing, Anahid. I'm going to call you Anahid because sure. it sounds more, <laughs> sounds more Armenian, right, Absolutely. for this journey. And it's an Armenian journey. Um, when you first started writing, you were writing for magazines, news right. magazines. What, what were you covering? I was covering health mm. and aging, actually. And <laughs> the first time I read my grandfather's memoir, when it was translated from Armenian into English, I had just finished an investigation into assisted living facilities and oh. we ended up changing the state law in New York and so it, it made me ask myself why am I spending my life telling other people's stories and not my own family's incredible one. And what kind of stories were you telling when you got out of, was it Northwestern when you started writing uh -huh. journalistic uh, pieces for magazines? Um, what took you to San Francisco and, and how did you end up writing for magazines instead of newspapers or whatever? Um, well, I, I jumped around a little. <laughs> I, <laughs> I worked for a travel guide after college um, and went to Greece. And um, oh. so I did travel writing for a while, and then, <laughs> which was fun. And, and then I went to, after grad school, I moved back to San Francisco where I had gone to college and started with Salon right when it was starting. And so it was an incredible experience and I covered travel and then I moved to healthcare, which I, I absolutely loved. And then, um, and then and various different subjects. So you did travel a lot and then you were talking about your, your grandfather's um, diaries, I guess, or writings. Um, you had a fellowship in Egypt what were you doing in Egypt? I was writing about hepatitis C. Really? Right. And um, Egypt has had, I don't know if it's still the case, but had a very large population with hepatitis C. Is that right? Well, they have a cure for that now. They have a, they have a, a pill, Harvari, which is fantastic. And I wonder if they did any kind of experimentation in, in Egypt. You know, I don't know because I, I wrote about this. This was in the early 2000s. Very but, early. Cause but I would hope that it's helped the situation. That's, that's really interesting. Did you have a, was there an Armenian community there? You know, there is. And I did meet, I did meet some Armenians when I was out shopping and this wonderful man. It just, it was almost like you just say you're Armenian and it was, <laughs> come to my house, I'll cook you dinner. And it was I an know. incredible, it's like this, this club that you belong to around the globe. We were, we were in uh, Egypt too. And the Armenians were fantastic. They were very cultured, very suave, very sophisticated, and I really enjoyed meeting them too. The, the point is, did that start you thinking at all about your grandfather's journey? You know, it. I, I was always thinking about my grandfather's journey because I grew up with the story like most Armenian families. Oh, so all the time. I had, but I hadn't been, I didn't, when I was in Egypt, I hadn't actually read my grandfather's uh, journals uh, yet, uh. but it did lay the foundation for international reporting and going to other countries and reporting out a story, So, particularly in the same region. So it prepared me for going to Turkey and Syria for this book. When you went to, to travel, just reading it to me was like an investigative uh, journalist, like digging for things. But also I felt like it was a memoir. So, what do you call it? <laughs> that is a very good question. <laughs> I, I've been having, you know, it, it's both. It's both um, creative nonfiction, the part about my grandfather, 
where I'm expanding his story through reporting and trying to write it in a um, in, in more like a novel. I guess I tell his story, and then it alternates with my story, which right. is a memoir. So, so we go back and his, forth. Right. Um, how did you decide on that style? It just happened, Joan. Um, it just happened. Well, that's let's ask. Let's talk about that because what's the physical process? Is that where it happens in the physical process of it? Yeah, so I started with my, my grandfather's story and I decided to follow his steps from his home outside Istanbul all the way to Syria. And, and so while I was retracing his, step, and I tried, his steps and I tried to go to all the places, the different towns where there were camps where he was interned. So before you even started writing, you were going to follow this path. And I think one of the things that I found in the book, which was really interesting, is you said your grandfather laid out the road map for you and you had to follow it. So it sounds like that, but had you already started deciding that you were going to write the book or were you just going to follow the road map? I decided, I, I left my job in New York, my magazine <laughs> job, to tell my grandfather's story and I was going to try as, as hard as possible to get his story to a larger audience and tell them about what happened during World War I and with the Armenians. So when I, I, it was a road map, exactly as you say, and I, I just plotted where he was and I, I went to all those different places. And what ended up happening is my experience was, became part of the story. And so that's when uh -huh. I wrote myself into the story, alternated with his account. Because let, let's talk about that, because you transitioned from 1915 to 2007 when this probably started. What is one of the transitions? Because you tell where you are, you talk about what you're doing, and then you go back to his thing. How do you uh, patch them together? Right. You know, it happened very organically. I was following his footsteps, and then I just had these incredible experiences in different locations where he was. And so they just it just fit together. And the moment that really made made it for a turning point for me and made myself made me write myself into my into mm -hmm. this book is that I found the family of the Arab Sheikh who saved my grandfather's life. Oh, you found the family I quite by accident or how? No, I I went looking for them. You went <laughs> and and they were incredible. It was this incredible experience of my life. It was one of the most incredible experiences of my life to find them. So that's part of your memoir part of it. You talk yes. about that. And then your grandfather's experience with them saving your grandfather comes next or before or whatever. It, yes, it, it, um, I believe in the experience. Um, in the book, I laid it out after because I wanted the reader to understand what this family, what this Arab Sheikh did for my grandfather and his time with them. So you mentioned Abriel Books. It's a wonderful bookstore in Glendale. And how did that fit into it? Was, were they instrumental in helping you in any way? Yes, it, <laughs> they, yes, they absolutely were. Because when I started this book, I was covering healthcare and aging, and I, I, <laughs> I really didn't know much about well, my, you know, the Armenian genocide. I had to teach myself. Oh, really? And so I, I just spent so many hours in that wonderful bookstore in the shelves, and and just look, pouring over their materials, and and I, that was a starting point for me. Uh, so, and, and then we go back into time, and I think what we should talk about are some of the photographs, because I don't know if Mahmoud Pasha Street, you have a picture of that. Uh -huh. Tell us a little bit about that. So before the war, my grandfather was a courier and a messenger, and he had just started his business and was very excited. And he would go back and forth between his town of Adabazar, now called Adabazari, to Constantinople, which it was, Istanbul was known as then. And he would stay at this boarding house on Mahmoud Pasha Street. Oh, I see. And so he would do a lot of his business dealings. And, and, and that was in Istanbul? Yes. Then yes. you have a picture of a cemetery. Yes, me by a, by a gravestone, yes. Yes, is it a gravestone? Yeah. So yes, 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 yes. Yeah. That is when I found the family of the Arab Sheikh who oh. saved my grandfather's life. We all went down to the cemetery because I wanted to um, pay my respects to the Sheikh oh. who had saved my grandfather's life. So we went to his, his, um, his 
his burial spot. And I was able to gather around with all his descendants and, and just say a prayer for him and oh. thank him. And, and so it was incredible. It was an incredible experience. The other uh, thing that I know there's a lot of photographs in here. And who took the photographs? Well, the photographs in the book are a combination of, there's archival photos of you know, Armenians in cattle cars, where, how they were deported. There were also photos of um, contemporary Turkey, which I just, I just took. Did which you take? I, yeah, that's what I wondered, <laughs> because you were like totally involved. We, there is a photograph of death in the desert, and how did that fit into the book? Oh, the, was it the on picture, the way to Syria? The or? picture is it the archival photo of the of the little girl who had died? Yeah, um, yeah, that was another archival photo um, that was that was taken during the time of the genocide and really illustrated what my grandfather witnessed and what he endured. And then uh, one last photo, the Adana. There's a there's a there's a picture. Oh, uh, of Adana. Oh, uh, Adana. Yes, yes, yes. Um, that was um, when I was in Turkey. I went to Adana, where my grandfather had passed through, and I wanted to visit a mosque and I wanted to be respectful. And so I stopped into a little um, store, and they I wanted to buy a headscarf. And it ended up being this wonderful community of women <laughs> who ended up giving me this makeover. And um, and they were just so happy that I was being respectful of their culture. And before I, I went into, do you speak Armenian? No, just like five words. But, only... but what did you? But but how did you get along on this journey? Because you were with a lot of different speaking people. Yes, I went with um, a wonderful, in, in Turkey, I, I had a translator with me. And then when I crossed into Syria, I had um, someone who spoke Arabic, another wonderful Armenian man who spoke Arabic. So also in the back, since we've come to the end of our book, there's lots of acknowledgments. How did you tra track all of those acknowledgments? There's so much. <laughs> I know it really took it took a community to write this book. There were so many people in the Armenian community and elsewhere who helped me with translations or tracking down documents and I pulled from collections and documents from six different countries. So they all helped you. Yes, they absolutely. Acknowledge... And I wanted to thank them. It was important to me. It took me 10 years to do this book. So Is that I... how long it took? 10 years. And what was the process? Did you use it, do a computer or did you handwrite or what did you do? Yes, I, I well, I took notes in, um, when you, you know, were... on, yeah, on a notebook when I was out in the field and then would, would take digital images of old newspaper articles um... so I can get them translated. And then also use my computer quite a lot. I bet you did. Are there more books in that computer? Uh, I don't. I don't know. I'm, I mean, this is this was this was the book that I had. This was really a labor of love. It took me ten years. So I'm probably going to work on some like, some shorter projects. For a while. <laughs> that's too long. Not back. To, well, that's why journalism is so great. You write a story and it gets published, and you've done it. Exactly. Do you exactly. think you go back to that? Yes, I do. I love <laughs> I love interviewing people, and I love hearing about their lives, and so I, I look forward to getting back to that. Well, it's a wonderful read, and I thank you so much for coming, Don McCain. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for watching the Joan Quinn profiles today in the uh, Brownettes makeup room. And keep writing to J-A-Q-U-I-N-N-1 at AOL.com. Bye.